All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Irrational Confidence Podcast. We're talking college football, and it is week number nine. It's the last weekend in October. Where has the time gone? It's spooky season. It's Halloween weekend. But my co-host, the man who still owns the world record in Vero Beach for trick-or-treating most houses in a night, my co-host, Fresh Fresh, how you doing, buddy? Perhaps, I mean, that's a, that's a record that'll probably stay in forever. You know, you got a fast car and you drive around and just jump out and run up and knock on the door. You got to get candy, man. When you're young, you got to get that candy. Perhaps I'm doing fantastic. You know, other than, um, you know, how my signs being stolen or, or allegedly stolen on the sideline, things are, things are going great. You know, we are in, uh, we are at the, the tough point of the season now where every game really matters a lot. Um, it's just, this is where the games get real tense and, uh, survive in advance every week. Yeah. The streaks that will never be broken, uh, the hit streak, Cal Ripken's consecutive game streak played, and the amount of houses Fresh has gone and trick-or-treated at in a row in a single night. Don't give out bad candy, folks. Do not give out bad candy. Nobody wants bad candy. Just give out the good Snickers bars. Make them happy. Keep, you don't want to get egged. Yeah, absolutely. And, and don't you dare hand out toothbrushes either. All right, nope. Fresh. Before we roll along here, folks, hit that subscribe button for us. Also, slam the notification bell. Get notified every single time we drop a new video. As we get further along this college football season, you're not going to want to miss a single game because we're going to hit every big game coming down the stretch and then going into the college football playoff and all of the bowl games later on in the month of December. So if you ever want to do anything to support the show, the easiest way to do it, hit that subscribe button right up there. And make sure you go to SpinnableSports.com because that is where the Irrational Confidence Podcast is part of SpinnableSports.com. All right, Fresh, before let's get rolling into the week action. Hey, you know, we've been kind of itching to talk about these two teams. It's one. They're both 6-1 and on the year. This game is going to be a 10-30 game late. Got to find out on FS1, but it's going to be a great game. The UNLV Running Rebels... They may have taken the running part out of their name, but the UNLV Rebels, they're 6-1, and 3-0 and in the Mountain West, are going and traveling to Fresno State in Fresno, California. At time of record, Fresno State is a 7.5-point favorite in this game. These two teams, they look pretty evenly matched on paper here, Fresh. Where are you seeing between Fresno State and UNLV? Well, first off, let's applaud both these schools being bowl eligible before, before Halloween. Um, right. that, that's gonna, that's an accomplishment. UNLV is the only losses to Michigan and that was 35 to seven. So there's, they have plowed through in the first year under Barry Odom. And I got a feeling Barry Odom being at UNLV actually in turn has a big reason why Arkansas's defense is struggling. He was in a defensive coordinator at Arkansas. They've had a little rough year this year. Him going to UNLV, bringing that knowledge and getting them turn that program around pretty quick is, is quite impressive there for the Rebs. Um, you mentioned running Rebels, you know, and, you know, Tarkania uh, uh, way back in the day, basketball running it through. Um, they're trying to – they actually can embody that running Rebels name now because this team is really led on the ground. They have the second-best rushing attack in the Mountain West Conference behind Air Force. They're averaging 425 total yards a game, and 209 of that is on the ground. They are literally embodying the running Rebels mentality. Run the football, run the football, run the football, play defense. And – they are led and propelled by three, three pretty solid running backs who have really taken their roles and have played well together in Vincent Davis, Donovan Lester, and Jaden Thomas. Davis run for 388 and two touchdowns so far. Lester's run for 325 and seven. And Thomas has run for 319 and seven touchdowns. The three of them just all working together, con- con- consistently getting four, five, six yards, you know, pop here and there, managing the clock, managing down a distance allowing the Rebel offense to move at a very solid pace, methodical, but keeping yourselves out of crazy situations, out of third and long, and putting touchdowns on the board. That's how you win. It's In, in the end, the grand scheme of things, football is not too complex. It's blocking and tackling, managing your down a distance on your first, you know, first and 10, second and 10, et cetera, et cetera, and then scoring touchdowns in the red zone. And so far, they've been able to take care of all those areas pretty, pretty successfully so far. Uh, in this 2023 season. And they're going to have to rely on the three of them as well as that offensive line come Saturday afternoon. Oh, Saturday night, excuse me. Um, on the other side, Fresno State, 
Offense is averaging about 415 total yards a game, but they're using the air attack. Not shocked by that at Fresno State and their quarterback situation, receiver situation over the years have always produced you know, at a pretty high rate and be able to keep that tradition going under Jeff Tedford. And they're averaging about 300 yards passing a game. Um, their offense is really a focal point around the quarterback, we've always said. Um, he's, there's not a star receivers really blown themselves past everybody else. It's a group collective effort. But, you know, really looking at it, can the quarterback situation for Mikey Keene, can he continue to keep developing and playing at a high level? Um, Throw for 1,600 yards and change, 15 touchdowns, four picks. He's got to show up here against a pretty good UNLV defense and get it done. Um, being at home, I think, is going to be much more uh, helpful to their offensive execution. But the passing game is definitely the focal point. And can, can you develop that, you know, his skills, get the offense continue to keep growing as they are and racing? Because we're at the very beginning of this Mountain West race. There are pretty quali- there are quality teams across the board. Um, and it's still wide open for who's actually going to be playing in that title game. So this is a chance to keep building and getting better and moving forward. Uh, the Bulldogs actually, as much as offense success and historically a great offense they are, their defense is what really is pushing them forward this season. They're second in the Mountain West, giving up 20 a game, and they're allowing 329 total yards, which is also second in the conference. So they have kind of changed the narrative out there, playing stingy defense, getting on and off the field, and keep giving their offense situations where they don't have to play the comeback machine, letting their young quarterbacks and receivers develop because they lost a bunch of guys in the draft last year, letting them grow, letting them get solidified, and letting the defense shut people down. Um, uh, both teams have 18 quarterback sacks, so they have no issues getting after the uh, opponents. So putting themselves, obviously, ideally, getting the opponents into third and long, getting after the quarterback, shutting them down, getting off the field. Um, it, it's something where they are going to focal point. It's been a focal point for both defenses of using that pass rush to really get home. This is going to be, I'm not going to say that the first real test for UNLV was Michigan because that game, that was not going to be a test for them. It's going to be more of like a new, you know, it's the second game as a head coach there trying to find out his players. This is going to be the first true real test. I don't, uh, Michigan was going to beat them regardless. Uh, this is the first true real test for this UNLV, UNLV, UNLV football team because now they are seeing success. They are bowl eligible. They're coming off a big win, surviving Colorado State. They are having now people are looking at them and saying they have a viable football team. How are they going to keep building off of this? Where can they go? Could they could they win the Mountain West? Could they play for the Mountain West title? Expectations are going to you know carry over them. Fresno State's been living with expectations on the football end for a long time. Jeff Tedford knows what he's doing. He knows the program. And actually going out to Fresno State, it's a it can be a hostile environment. It's in the middle of nowhere. Um, no offense to anyone who lives out there, but it is the middle of nowhere, Northern California. It, it's a journey to get out there. It's not on the strip there in Vegas like UNLV is playing their football games at. You're going to have to make an effort. The fans love Fresno State football. They're going to be loud because they still know they're still a contender for the, the Mountain West title as well. And that's where I think that plus the defense plus a, a decent offense gives Fresno State the advantage. Um, UNLV is in a spot where they haven't been in years, and I think that eventually might catch up with them. I'm taking Fresno State in this football game, and I'm taking Fresno State to cover. I think the Bulldogs get it done. UNLV will not be embarrassed. They will maybe lose by like nine, but this is going to be a chance for them to sort of get that, that you know, they're getting a heat check on their run. Um, both are going to be quality football teams, have something to stay at the very end of the year, but I think Fresno State gets the win, and they continue to say, hey, don't forget about us. We're the defending champions, and we're still here. So, Fresh, the one thing that I'm looking at still is, is Mikey King going to play in this game for Fresno State? I think that's going to be the big difference maker. As of right now when we're recording this, the injury we haven't gotten any injury update. He's still listed as uncertain. Uh, they talked about a little bit in earlier on the week pre- uh, press conference that he may or may not play in this game. Fresno State's had two weeks off. He missed the previous game as well. If if he does miss this game, it's a different team under Logan Fife. The, you don't have the dynamic passing attack that you do with Mikey King. I think that's going to be a huge difference maker if he can't go in this game. If he can go, I kind of feel with you. I'm, I'm on board. But, you know, you talked a little bit about the matchup that and the advantage that Fresno State has on the has on the receiving end of this football game. UNLV has two really good cornerbacks. Six foot two, Jackson Turner has three interceptions on the year. Six foot one, Jonathan Baldwin. He's got two interceptions on the year. The name I'm really interested, though, is the first one there. Jackson Turner. 
one of the things I learned early on in watching football fresh is how do you really judge a great lockdown cornerback, especially in a conference like the Mountain West? You know, we're not talking about you're not constantly going up against power five teams and you judge those players on the lack of tackles that they have on the year. What that means is, and people go, well, what do you mean? Why would you judge a player on the lack of tackles, especially at the defensive back position? And then what it means is that the quarterback does not go to that side of the field. They avoids that side of the field at all costs. And you take a look at Jackson Turner's stats on the year. Three interceptions, only 12 tackles, zero pass defended. Opposing quarterbacks are staying away from wherever he goes on the side of the field, whether he's matching up with the number one receiver, whether or not they're moving, he's moving in with the motion, what have you. This kid is someone that could, we could very well see his maybe a late round draft pick for him and someone really get a kind of a diamond in the rough over there. He is a senior um, this year and he has played very, very well for them. I think that it's going to be come down. The question is, can UNLV run the football? Like you said, UNLV right now averaging over 200 yards a game on the ground. They're second to Air Force, but Air Force runs the ball, what, 50, 60 times a game? They maybe throw three or four passes. UNLV is a much more balanced attack. Again, Fresh, I'll be with you. If Mikey Keene plays in the game, give me Fresno State, and and I'll say they're going to cover at the 7.5. If he's not playing and they're going Logan Fife, I, I kind of would say UNLV in the upset. I, I think that I'm not just going to say UNLV in the points. I'm going to say UNLV in the upset because Fresno State, while they don't give up a huge amount of rushing yards, they still do allow them. And that, when you, especially when you have a three headed monster in a backfield where you can wear down a team's off a defensive line over and over and over and just keep constantly attacking it, especially with those guys that they got, that's a beast of a running back stable. Like, that is, it, it's Halloween weekend. That is a scary three-headed monster over there. That is like a Frankenstein backfield over there. I love it. I'm, you know what, Fresh? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go out on a limb here because again, I, there's too much uncertainty for Fresno State for me. So give me UNLV. I'll take UNLV in the pure upset. And then if you're gonna give me seven and a half as well, I'll take it. So give me the Rebels in this game. Um, one question: like if if it's announced, let's say Friday, um that Keen's not playing and Fife is a starter. How much would that line be adjusted? I think it drops like two points. I think it goes underneath so the touchdown. And half. Yeah, okay. five and a half. Um, you know, I think Fresno State's a more established pro- program. We've talked Fresno State a handful of times over the last three years. It'd be interesting to see. UNLV is it's that upstart, and this is a perfect game for them to pull an upset. Remember, we, we were talking a couple weeks ago a dangerous team like UNLV that is on the rise, especially in a conference like the Mountain West, they just need that moment where they knock off one of the big dogs in that conference. Yeah, I, mean, I think wor- at worst case, it drops to four and a half and because you still have that home field advantage plus, you know, having a yeah. more recent success, they'll still stick around. And you're right about the Fresno State fan base, man. That's a tough – people don't give that enough credit. It's a tough place to go in and play at. So – all right, Fresh, let's go to our second game of the week. It is Pac-12 after dark. I, it's been a while since we've talked about Pac-12 after dark. Love it. Love these games, guys. This may be the one of the best Pac-12 after dark games we've seen in a long, long time. Oregon State, 6-1 and one on the year, 3-1 and one in the Pac-12, and they are only sitting with a, a very, very, very close loss to uh, – Washington State, right? Mm-hmm. Earlier in the season, they're traveling yep. to Arizona. Arizona, like the surprise team of the Pac-12. They're four and three on the year. They've sh- kind of struggled, but you take a look: double overtime loss in a game they probably should have beat USC in, and then going toe to toe all game long with Washington. The Wildcats are probably one of the best stories in the Pac-12 right now. And so is Oregon State. So I love this game here, Fresh, but I'll turn it over to you. I'm not sure if uh, Delora's playing in this game or not as well. So another quarterback injury we got to monitor. 
There's a lot of injuries right now. We actually have a bunch of them that we're going to be talking about tonight, the quarterback injuries. But um, Arizona was my surprise team during our conference preview. So if you don't believe me, go pull up all the YouTube videos. Go back to August and see our you know FBS um, group of five or power five, excuse me, um, previews. It'll be right there stated. Um, I'm actually kind of they, they. I'm happy they came through and they're actually playing at a good rate. Um, you mentioned the loss to USC, but they have three losses to Mississippi State, Washington, and USC by a combined 17 points. All were single-digit losses. Two of those games went to overtime. This squad has a couple of years ago they were maybe one win if they're lucky. You know, it, they trip into a victory by accident. They're playing successful football. Everybody's contributing, offensive line, defensive line, linebackers, secondary, receivers, you know, kicker, punter, holder, whoever, they're all helping each other. And they're all bought in on the program to be successful. And that is where you're starting to see this. It's not by accident this team is playing well. Because if you're just there and you're getting on just, you know, chilling out, you're not totally bought in, you would have rolled over in the third quarter maybe to Washington USC. But with everybody there striving to win and get to a bowl game, they have motivation to play for each other. And that's where it's something scary, but it's something cool to see when you see a program rise from the ashes um, and, and gather and move forward and grow. And this is where, you know, we talk, we see coaches get, we always call people calling for firings of head coaches. Um, sometimes you got to let coaches be there for three to four years in programs that are definitely a rebuild. We're, we're too much of an instant where, man, that's, they haven't got to a bowl game in three years. Screw it. Fire them all. Yeah, programs are like that where they're they're not the profile, they're they're not off the beaten path, if you will, or they were once great, but they're still trying to recover. You got to give them time. You can't keep rushing in new coaching staffs. So I think that's what we're starting to see here at Arizona, where if you let coaches sort of get there for three or four years, you let them sort of build a culture and grow. Eventually, you'll start seeing success. Um, we can't keep pushing coaching in organizations unless they've actually com- committed some serious violations out the door after two years they they haven't been to a bowl game because then it causes issues for turnover on the coaching staff, the program integrity, the culture, the players, it all becomes a mess. You've got to let sometimes sort of things develop on their own. And that's what we're seeing down there right now in Tucson. Um, The Wildcats right now are throwing for 287 a game and they're rushing for 164. That's a pretty solid balance uh, from an offensive perspective. They're scoring 31 and the defense is giving about 20 points a game. So, if you're winning by 11 points on average, that's pretty solid considering you have three single-digit losses. It means in other games, they're blowing people out and they're getting the job done and they're scoring. Uh, like you mentioned, Delora, he was, you know, he's still up in air if he's going to be playing right now. Um, don't for over 1,000 yards, nine touchdowns, five picks. He ran for 131 so far and three touchdowns. But I think the more impressive thing is Noah Fafita. The past three games, obviously those two losses, one to Washington and one to USC, but he's had them in the football game. How can you expect in other situations where you're rebuilding program, you put your backup in, and you're actually being more competitive, and then you come out and you stop Washington State 44 to 6? This team, it shows they're playing for each other, and they all have depth, and they're growing. And what he's been able to do, throwing for 946 and eight touchdowns and two picks, is put them in good situations to succeed, but also limit the turnovers. You know, to the five interceptions, two interceptions, they've lost two to very good, to above average football teams who have offense but they've been able to minim- minimize the turnovers, keep their offense in the in the right situations, and put points on the board on drives. And that's how you are successful, and that's how you end up potentially you know, put yourself in a situation to actually get an upset. Now we're just waiting for that one point of when do you get that upset? Washington State, they've been a, a good program. They haven't been as uh, on fire the past couple of weeks as they were early in the year. Do I really call that an upset? It was. They were ranked. That deserved to you know, They were a high-profile team. But now you have a chance to really – Take that to the next level and beat Oregon State. If you beat Oregon State, then your program has truly gotten there. Like, you're right. We've got back to back top 25 wins. We've done it at home. We've done it, you know, with, with the lights on us, people watching us. Now we can be taken seriously. Recruits start taking a better look. The players build more confidence and you start growing from there. Because they, you know, getting to a bowl game right now is Arizona's goal. You have four wins right now. It's not going to be easy to get that six wins unless you pull off an upset. You look at it, they got Oregon State this week, UCLA, Colorado, Utah, and Arizona State coming up. That's If you start looking on the outside, that's tough. Like, where are they going to get the six wins? You have to beat Colorado and you have to beat Arizona State. And then I think you would feel better about that as the season goes on if you get one of those upsets. So this this is a great situation for them to really put it all together. Because if you get if you beat Air, Oregon State, can they show up and beat Colorado? There's a good chance. Can they beat Arizona State? Good chance. 
that puts you at seven wins. It doesn't put those in dire need, especially that rivalry game at the end of the year where you have to win to get to bowl game where anything can happen. It, it puts you in a tense spot. So getting the wins now, finding ways to get upsets, builds that energy for the football team. On the other side, Oregon State has been extremely consistent all year. They have they are who they are. Jonathan Smith and that entire team, defense, run the football. DJU is it's amazing how DJU has played so free and in not stressing out this year. He's not in the tense moment under Diablo Sweeney where maybe he wasn't flowing with the offense. He was making bad calls. The offensive line wasn't there. Everything sort of falls on him as being the next quarterback at Clemson. And it just all the bottom falls out. He's playing free, stressless, you know, hitting receivers, making right decisions. The offense is buying in around him. They're all jailed together and they're putting points on the board. They don't have to put up 60 points a game. They can manage it a different way and be successful. That's a coaching thing. That is a team camaraderie thing. It's understanding the goal is just to win the football game. You don't have to win every game 50 to nothing. If you win, you win. And eventually it takes care of itself at the end of the season. And that's where Oregon State's leadership is. I think this is a veteran football team. I think with Arizona beating Washington State and playing Washington and Arizona and USC so close, it has Oregon State's attention. It's not like they're going to appear out of the middle of nowhere and get upset. I think Oregon State's going to come into this football game, play smart. They will survive, just like the, the past few opponents in USC and Washington have. I think Oregon State wins by six. They will cover the, the spread. Um, it won't be a flashy win. I think they're just going to hold on late. Arizona will give them all they want to handle. Um but Oregon State will just survive. And another sign, I think it'll be a positive for both teams. Of We're still seeing growth from Arizona State. I mean, from Arizona, excuse me. But Oregon State is showing a resolve of a very good football team by being able to go into a hostile environment against an up-and-coming team and just get a W and get out alive. Um, it's worth sign that both teams are growing. I think that's where we're going to football game we're going to see late on Saturday night. Yeah, fresh. Everything in Arizona is just a little bit hotter. And I take a look at something that's going on with the Wildcats. This team has been realistically on fire. You you want to talk about the losses that they've had. Not a single loss have they looked like they've been overwhelmed. And you take a look at what, you know, losing Jane Delora, whatever, because, again, we hate the fact that we don't get injury reports, like, full time here unless it's a season-ending injury. You take a look at Noam for how you say the last name again? Fafita, I think. Fafita. I, I, I so believe it's, it's Fafita. So it sounds a lot like Fajitas to me. And again, this is what I'm thinking as I'm going. This kid is like when you go to the Mexican restaurant and the and they the waitress brings the fajitas past you and you hear the sizzle off of the pan. You hear that crackling. And that's that's how this kid's playing. You take a look at what the difference between him and Delora there, he's completing 6% more of his passes than, than the other guy. And again, he's played less time, taking a few, taking a little more hit when it comes to sacks. But I've been impressed with the freshman. And that's the crazy thing. The kid's a freshman. And he's playing this way. But, you know, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the dual threat weapon that they have in Jonah Coleman here. Take a look at what Jonah Coleman did this past week against Washington State. He had three touchdowns on the ground, and then on top of that, oh yeah, we'll throw in a bunch of a couple of catches and have oh, almost 160 yards of total offense combined. Oregon State, if they're going to win this football game, Oregon State's going to have to know where he is at all times on this on the field. They have weapons. They have guys that can get on space, make some big plays along the way. Here, I really think. Arizona is going to give people some fits. I'm going to tell you this, Fresh. You gave the next last five games of Oregon or of Washington's schedule. And I'm sorry, not Washington, Arizona. You gave the last five games of their schedule there. Three of their last five, Arizona plays ranked teams. I will tell you before this year is out, they will pull the upset in one of those three ranked games here. All right, this Arizona team is fun to watch. They're going to make for a heck of a bowl game wherever they wind up at. Oregon State's going to win this football game, and I think they're going to win and cover the three-and-a-half-point spread. I'm also going to take the over in this game. The over set at 56.5. 
I think that this is going to be a lot of points late at night. I think that Arizona and Oregon are going to be two heavyweights going in there. If you can stay awake till one in the morning, I think it'll be well worth your time in this game. Damian Martinez is doing everything we thought he could do and more, but then he's also getting some spell help with Deshaun Fenwick. This team is just something special that's happening in Corvallis. They're just a different team. This is not your Oregon State who wins less than double-digit games in a, in a person's college career. It, it's so weird because this Oregon State team has no home next year. And I think that's motivating them. I think that defense is a bend-don't-break defense. I think they swarm the football. I think that they give you a little bit in between the 20s and kind of bend, but then when they get into the red zone, they lock it down. You take a look at what they've done on the defensive side of the football. And again, I talked a little bit in the previous game about the defensive secondary. These guys are getting their hands on the football. They have, so far this season, 36 passes they've gotten their hands on the football, either whether batting the ball down or getting an interception. They're not going to give you anything easy on the, on, through the air. You're going to have to soften up this defense and really take advantage of what they're going to give you. I love this game here, Fresh. I really do. I'm excited to see this one. I'm really thinking that this could be maybe a respect game. People are going to look at this, though. If Oregon State wins this football game, they're going to look at Arizona and go, oh, it will you be a form for Arizona team. Right. A Anyone other than you say that they had Arizona State or Arizona at form four on their bingo card? Because I'll be the first one to tell you, I didn't. That's a good football team in Tucson. Even if you lose this football game, you should hold your heads up high. I like the Wildcats a lot. I think they're doing some great things out there. I'm excited to see what, how they finish off this year. But like I said, give me Oregon State in this game, and I'll, I'll take the points as well. And one person to watch there for Arizona, if they're involved in this football game, Jacob Cowling, wide receiver. He started off at UTEP past, past couple years here at Arizona, 55 receptions, 425, but he's eight touchdowns. So in the red zone, keep an eye out for him. He could be a big difference maker um, come Saturday night. And just on a side with Oregon State, at some point, don't you just want to see like Ocho Cinco and TJ Hushmanzada, Steven Jackson, just sort of show up on the sideline one day in Corvallis and you know, get, get back home and, and show that, you know, they're, they're supporting because I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure I'll be corrected by YouTube, but I think Jonathan Smith was the quarterback the year that Chad Johnson and TJ, TJ Hushmanzada in the Fiesta Bowl. So bringing them all back there on the sideline, hanging out, I think that'd be really cool if this team continues to um, go in where we think they're going to go. Absolutely. I, I just really think that we need, if Oregon State wins this football game, and they got a lot in front of them still, man, they, that, that's the heck of a resume they're starting to build there. It's a heck of a resume. In a, in a pretty good league that's going to keep adding on to it. I know. All right, Fresh, let's go to our fan vote game of the week here. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you do not already follow us on the X, formerly known as Twitter, make sure you follow us on social media there as Fresh throws up the X sign there. We, every single week, we let you decide on what game we should add to our preview each and every week. This week, Winning by a wide margin, the Ohio State Buckeyes traveling to Camp Randall Stadium and the Wisconsin Badgers. At time of record, this game, Ohio State is a 14-and-a-half-point road favorite, over-under set at 43-and-a-half. Which one of these two things is not like the other? That kind of One or the other of those is coming in. I don't think I'm going to have a hard time believing both will come in there. So, fresh. Buckeyes coming off of a huge win. They could. This could be a possible letdown game for them. Camp Randall. It's at nighttime. Not an easy place to go into. I know Wisconsin's dealing with stuff, but Luke Fickle is their head coach, and he will have these boys ready to play against his alma mater. Fresh. I'll turn it over to you. What you got for Ohio State Wisconsin? Well, I basically think Vegas is saying Ohio State's going to win. 24 to nothing or something like that, where the Badgers aren't scoring. That that Buckeye defense, 
we already knew they were really good coming into it. And what they did to that run, the rushing attack and Drew Allar and that Penn State offense, they annihilated them. There was nothing that Penn State could do. And I think Vegas really loves that Buckeye defense. They're saying that they have no faith in the Badgers, mainly because Mordecai's, you know, knocked out. And Braden Locke, he showed a very, you know, a lot of a lot of effort, a lot of moxie last week, um, leading that nice little comeback, organizing some drives against Illinois. But the Illinois defense is not the Ohio State defense. Um, I think we've also still been waiting for the air raid offense there for the Badgers to take off, and it's looked a little clunky. It's year one, but they are just – it hasn't been as fluid as everyone expected. And Phil Longo coming from North Carolina, people were like, well, Sam Howell did it, Drake May did it. Why can't the Badgers offense you know, go four wide and, and chuck it around? And it's just been – it's been a slow start. But Braylon Allen is still the cog for the Badgers running the football. And we saw all season long, if he gets involved and gets going – it opens up the passing game, not from what maybe an air raid perspective, but it gives them a little more flexibility in that offense. That's what the kind of thing they're trying to – the Badgers need to see some of that on Saturday night. They need to see this offense take it to the next level because in any situation of pulling, an off, pulling off an upset, whether you're on the road or at home, you've got to score touchdowns and you cannot kick field goals. That means in the red zone, you've got to find ways – and maybe occasionally you've got to hit a 60, you know, a 50 yard or 60 yard touchdown. You got to break a big one, shorten the time, but also hit a big touchdown, sort of shock some, shock the system of the opponent. If Wisconsin can get maybe one or two of those in the football game, a couple of big plays, they'll be in good shape. But this Buckeye team, um, unless they're extremely hungover, um, I, I, I think they found that uh, they, they show their identity of who they are. They are going to play great defense. McCord's going to put them in great situations, and Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to get nine, ten receptions, a hundred plus yards, and a touchdown. Um, they don't have to win sexy. They don't have to win sixty to nothing. They just need to come out there and get get the business done on the road against Wisconsin and keep moving forward. And this could be, you know, a, a Big Ten title game preview. Who knows what's going to come out of the Big Ten West? But you got to continue to keep continue to keep taking care of business. I think what the events this past week. Um, coming out with the whole Michigan stuff is adding fuel in that maybe, hey, they were stealing our signs. Allegedly, we've got to get going. We've got to make sure we have a destiny set, undefeated, undefeated up in Ann Arbor. Um, don't let anything get in our way. I think that might have uh, given a little extra recharge, knowing that they have some extra motivation there. Maybe stuff, quote unquote, maybe was stolen from the past two years, and they have a little little anger behind them. And they have a mission to keep moving forward. Anything you can do to motivate your football team coming off a big win to keep focus going forward, I think is what you need to pull out right now. And Ryan Day has a lot right now he can use as material. So Buckeyes have a, a, a focus. It's, a, it's also a nice little win. You go into Madison, people start saying, yeah, you went into Iowa, you went into Madison. Like, there are wins that the opponent might not matter, but the venue and the, the logo matter a little bit more in, the, in, in any kind of conference you go to. Going to Madison at night, it's not a noon kickoff. Getting a W would reflect um, with the voters, with the committee coming up in their first, you know, week from now, week from actually, you know, yeah, a week from now, the first playoff poll is going to come out. Chance to really add to that of making a shock in all the moment. If they have a chance to score an extra touchdown, I got a feeling Ryan Day is going to do that because they want to add that extra impact of, hey, you remember what we just did last night? We beat Penn State the week before. You should be ranking us much higher than what you have right now. Keep bumping us up. We're going to put it on. And I think that's where you might see some other teams across the spectrum if they're in that contention. Instead of shutting it down, maybe put the extra touchdown there just for that initial surge right before the first poll. But the Badgers have a chance to pull off an upset. They're going to have to be flawless. They have to come out and score touchdowns, and they've got to seize any opportunities. If you get a turnover, if you punch that ball out, you've got to score a touchdown. Field goals won't get it done. McCord, just protect the ball. You're, there's been two chances so far in the season. One versus Notre Dame, one versus Penn State, where on the final drive, the Notre Dame player dropped the interception, and then the fumble was called back due to holding call. The holding call was legit, but you've had turnovers that you've gotten away with that should have been turnovers that weren't. Will you make that mistake in a, in a road game that could be costly? You've got to learn how to protect the football. Sometimes maybe you won't ball won't bounce your way. You can't afford to have those losses. Um, a loss to Wisconsin would be a bad loss. Uh, for this football team. So you just got to go in there, manage yourself, hit your receivers, trust your offense and defense for Ohio State. Do what you do, and you'll come out unscathed. Um, if you guys overlook the Badgers, you, you could be in for a rough night in Madison. I had the Buckeyes covering. Um, I take the under. 
I just trust the Buckeyes defense too much for the Badgers to score. Fresh. This is a fascinating one to me because if Ohio State goes into Madison and loses this football game, all the goodwill that you built up in your big win against Penn State is now out the window. You you, do, you may, had a dominant defensive performance against the Nittany Lions. If you can go into, like you said, going into Madison and having that same type of defensive performance – the thing that people don't talk about, everyone wants to talk about certain things from that Penn State game, but no one wants to talk about how the Buckeye defense shut down Allen and Singleton in that game. If you can go into Madison and do the same thing to Braylon Allen, you deserve a lot of respect. Braylon Allen's averaging 5.9 yards a carry right now. He's got eight touchdowns. He is the Wisconsin offense. Right. Brady Lock, Braylon Locke, I like the kid, he, but he's, he's not Mordecai. And even Mordecai, we, we weren't seeing the same Mordecai that we saw at SMU the last couple of years. Something's off with that kid. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's scheme. I don't know if it's just the cold weather from being in Texas versus being in Wisconsin. I don't know what it is. But if you can go into Camp Randall and you can shut down the running attack of the Badgers because – Wisconsin's going to be able to run the football just like they always can. If you can do that, then this defense is truly like on a mission because you take a look at their, their next couple of games. And this was one of the games like you talked about. We talked early in the season about a, a couple games stretch there for Ohio State. We talked about Maryland, talked about Penn State. And we talked about this Wisconsin game. You get through this game here. You're talking Rutgers. Rutgers is better, but they're still Rutgers. You're talking Minnesota. You're talking the program that is Michigan State, the shell of a program there. And you're you're moving towards that that final matchup at the end of the year, the game that really matters to Ohio State fans. And you're on this mission there. For Ohio State, it for me it's it's making sure you're healthy. It's making sure that, you know. Travion Henderson is getting the rest he needs to. Are you going to need him in this game? Chip Trainum and Mayan Williams have done a very nice job for him. Travion Henderson is the more explosive running back out of the three, but if he needs another week, then so be it. Let the other two guys cook. Then you talk about Ameke Ibuka. You take a look at him. Is he going to be good for the, go for this game? I want this team to be fully healthy going into the end to that last part of the season. This team is poised to make a lot of noise. This is a very good team. They say, you know, offense sells tickets, but defense wins championships. This is a team that really is kind of looking at the best compare. One of the best comparisons I have heard about this Ohio State team is not to the 2015 team that won the first college football playoff. The best comparison I heard was the 02 Ohio State national title team. Kyle McCord, very similar to Craig Krenzel. Not super sexy, doesn't like throw for 300 yards, but doesn't completely make mistakes. Uh, you take a look at that season right there. Michael Jenkins was the lean receiver. Yes, Marvin Harrison is outperforming Michael Jenkins by a huge wide margin. But what I'm saying is this, this team is really a kind of a throwback to Jim Tressel. And the thing that I love about it is that showing that Ryan Day can do a different type of team. We've gotten so used to Ryan Day Buckeye teams being this offensive juggernaut and defense has kind of been secondary to them. The 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 script has been flipped. This is a defense-led team that puts their offense in great positions to win. Give me Ohio State in this game. That four, you know, I hate 14 and a half going into Camp Randall. I respect Wisconsin way too much. So I would actually take Wisconsin. Ohio State's going to win the game. But give me Wisconsin's going to keep it closer than people will think just because they're on the road. They'll have respect for it. That place will be rocking. It always is rocking against Ohio State. So give me Wisconsin and the points, Ohio State to win. And I'm actually going to take the over of the 43 and a half. I think Wisconsin's going to score a few more points than people will give them credit for. Ohio State's going to win on a little bit more of a shootout. So I'm going to say something along the lines of like a 31-17 game, 
31-21 type of game, about a 10-point win for Ohio State. I mean, I think it's just give us a game at night. Um, if it's a blowout, people are going to bed early, and they won't, they'll miss out on the Pac-12 after dark later. Right. And we don't want that, that to happen at all. All right, Fresh. Let's go to the Plains, the Big 12. Man, this game was was really exciting a couple weeks ago. It's kind of lost a little bit of its luster, but I don't necessarily say like a ton of its luster. Oklahoma, the Sooner 7-0 and right now. They survived the scare from UCF. They came down off that big win from Tex against Texas and, and survived a scare against the Knights. Kansas, Rock Chalk Jayhawk at 5-2. and two. And congratulations, Kansas. You guys, I'm going to give you the honorary. You are the most dedicated fan base for supporting our podcast in, this, in the entire United States. So, hey, thank you, Kansas fans, if you're listening and watching this. So we appreciate you all. But Oklahoma, man, they have looked just fantastic, especially after how rough last year went. And we kind of started to see signs of it, especially in that bowl game against Florida State. Dylan Gabriel, fresh. This kid, it, were we, ju- we were just a year too early on him. I guess that's the best way to put it. Like we talked about Dylan Gabriel two years ago 2,100 yards, 19 touchdowns, three interceptions. He's been phenomenal. Got running backs Marcus Majors, Toby Walker, both of them helping him out. Gosh, this is a great Oklahoma team. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I'll turn it over to you, Fresh. What you got for Oklahoma, Kansas? Well, I think the first we got we got to tip the cap to Brett Venables. Um, he put in a great recruiting class, but he also hit the transfer portal real hard and redid this entire roster because last year was 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 pretty rough. It was, and people had some dire straits of is he the right guy? Um, and even through the season, it started out, they blew out some teams. They kind of looked a little rough for Cincinnati. There's a noon kick, whatever. Um, but they were prepared for Texas. And that was from the very from the very jump. You saw them focused defensively, offensively. They took advantage of Texas mistakes and put touchdowns on the board. And then Gabriel on the last drive, you know, guy in the field, hit the game winning touchdown, um, which cost me a lot of money in Vegas, but we're going to move on from that. Um, but Oklahoma just, they, they've, rallied around each other of we are Oklahoma and we're going to do it whatever way we have to do it. Um, and that's been coaching. That has been the players owning it up and being responsible and, 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 a, and he holding each other accountable. Um, there's a connection there on this team that it's, it's rare. And you start seeing guys who weren't really high, highly acclaimed, like any of us coming in, we're like, they didn't, who, who's the leading receiver on this football team? What are we going to, you know, Stoops, his son. You know, that's the kind of the way you look at the roster. And here we are. The running backs have all found themselves. They have the rotation. The receivers are making you know plays. They're reliable. And, and Gabriel, who he, he showed flashes at UCF, got injured, um, didn't know if he's going to be able to rebound last year, and, and he played okay. You know, did he get, how was that career going to take off? And he's now got himself in his major rebound from getting over the injury, fully recovered, and is the true leader of this team. And it's more impressive. He's held off Jackson Arnold. We came out of the year. Is Jackson Arnold going to be in competition? Right. Is Gabriel, how's Gabriel going to play? Maybe that was what he needed, the motivation of. He was a veteran quarterback supposed to be there last year, sort of fill the gap for year one, see what happens. But right now, he's looking over his shoulder and telling that five-star quarterback, sit down, young boy, I'm in charge. And uh, he's not letting go of the spot. And the team is sort of, hey, they're there for They're making plays. and um, it's 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 good to see this team is on the cusp of a playoff spot. They know they have it right there in form. They just take care of business the rest of the way. They're in. I think you'll get one, maybe you know, maybe even play Texas again. That's two you know two ranked wins over Texas. That's pretty eye popping. That puts you in the playoff, in my opinion, um, if you're undefeated, because there aren't many other ranked wins on their schedule. But they're minding their own business, doing what they have to do, and keep plowing forward. Last week, I think they were hung over. They didn't take UCF seriously. Gus Malzahn always can be a little sneaky. If he made a better play call there on the two-point conversion, they might have been losing. But you know what? Teams that end up playing in conference title games, they get lucky along the way. And maybe that was their lucky game where they just they survived. And I think 
Now this week, you're going to have a much more focused Oklahoma team who gets past that one clunker of a football game and really is going to be able to move forward because they see the end at the tunnel. They see Kansas this week. they got Bedlam coming up. Um, they know there's a path there for them. And now like, like our, we can be motivated. We've got past our one sleepy game and moving forward. On the other side now, Kansas, we've saw them play real well early in the year. They've been up and down lately. Jalen Daniels dealing with injuries early on. He's not been fully consistent in the lineup. We, like you said, there's no injury reports. Is he going to play? Is he not going to play? Um, who knows? Jason Bean has filled in very, very nicely yes. for the Jayhawks at quarterback. Um, we always kind of look, if Daniels is down, who's going to show up? But Bean has actually been there and been really has much of a hasn't been much of a drop off at the quarterback position. You look at Daniels right now through the season, completed about 75% of his passes for 705 yards, five touchdowns, one pick. And actually in the, in the rating system they have out there, one rating system has it at a 173. Looking at Bean, he's completed 65% of his passes for 913 yards, nine touchdowns, two picks and a rating of 173. Almost, almost identical between the two of them. And they both have 27 carries for less than 100 yards. So neither of them are actually using the ground game. Now, let's be mindful. Sacks are taken away from the rushing stats. So factor that in there And when it comes down to less than 100 yards rushing. But they're almost identical from a quarterback position. And that also goes to the coaching staff, Lance Leipold, getting your quarterbacks in positions to be successful, throw touchdowns, and not turn the football over. And if you're trying to pull off upsets, you do not turn the football over. Let's see if, you know, if Bean or Daniels, if he's healthy, can play and be able to manage through, keep their team in the down and distance. They play great versus Texas. Can they, they didn't play a full game, though. Can they play a full game versus Oklahoma and get an upset? To do that, Devin Neal, the running back, has got to be a superstar. He's got to have the ball a lot. And whether it's in the passing game and the ground game, he's got to be very involved to keep that Kansas offense moving and to score touchdowns when they get in the red zone. Um, speaking of the red zone, Kansas and Virginia Tech are the only two college football, FBS football programs that have allowed points to their opponents on every trip into the red zone. So Oklahoma, if you get into the 20-yard line, you're scoring. Can Kansas finally get a stop? Can they stop Oklahoma in the red zone? If they can, that shows a defense making a turn and showing improvement. If not, Oklahoma's going to get inside the 20s. They're going to score, and the streak's going to kind of continue. Um, will Kansas defense show up and can we get a turnover? Can they shorten the field? Can somebody make a play on that side of the football to slow down Gabriel and that Oklahoma offense? Because right now, I think they're finding a groove. They're putting up points. They don't feel like they're going to get stopped. Can you show up and make, a, and make a play and get off the field and help your offense and shorten the field potentially to set up a, a go-ahead score? Um, in the end, I think the Sooners cover. It's 10. I think they cover that. I think the over at 65 and a half is going to hit. Um, we'll see some points. I think we'll see some points from Kansas. They'll provide some offense, but in the late in the late in the second half, Oklahoma will pull away and cover that ten. Fresh, you know this is a noon kick, and yeah, it, it is in Kansas, so there's there's that factor as well. You know, with everything that we've talked about with Oklahoma, we're we're being remiss if we don't mention the freshman superstar that they have. Yeah, they have a superstar in the waiting quarterback in Jackson Arnold. We think he is going to be a very, very good quarterback when his time comes. And I love the fact that you said that Dylan Gabriel has basically said, kid, watch and learn. Let me show you how it's done here. But Nick Anderson. No, we're not talking about the Nick Anderson from, that played from the Orlando Magics back in the day that bricked a couple of free throws. We're talking about the 6'4 freshman, 209-pound kid who – has 16 catches on the year, and half of them have gone for touchdowns. Kids averaging 24 yards a catch. This kid is ridiculous. Like, absolutely ridiculous. Take a look what he did against UCF. He balled out in that game. Five catches, 105 yards, two touchdowns. How does Kansas match up with that kid? Like, that's going to be my question going into this game. Can Kansas do something where they can neutralize him? Are you going to double coverage him? And then all of a sudden, when you start making a double, you start double coverage him, it's going to leave a lot of things open underneath. That's where Stoops is shine for them. That un, those underneath passing routes, and you saw it in the Texas game. Texas would drop back. They have a little bit, have a, a deep safety back. 
And they were just nickel and diamond them all the way down the field and using the short passing game, five, six, seven yards a catch. And then all of a sudden, Oklahoma is sitting at the 15 yard line and you're like, how in the world did they get down the field so quickly? And I think that's the uniqueness of what Venables has done at Oklahoma for this offense this season. I think it helps immensely that they have Dylan Gabriel back. I think it's amazing that Dylan Gabriel is fully healthy this season and doing the things that we knew that he could do. As for the Jayhawks, this has been a great season for them. If they pull off this upset, it's probably maybe an all-time great season. They're bowl eligible automatically. They're going to be in line for a late December bowl. I don't necessarily know if they're going to pick a New Year's Day six bowl if this, but you can see them, you know, pull off one that we have a lot of respect for. You know, you could see them in the Duke's Mayo Bowl or something like that, where someone's putting mayo on their head, or you know, you take a look at what was the one that uh, North Carolina Oregon played last year out in San Diego. Yeah, the Holiday Bowl. Yep. So that would be again another type that Kansas gets over to because this is a really good Kansas team. You know, I think Oklahoma, I think Oklahoma's going to win. I think Oklahoma's going to cover that 10 points there. And also, I, I, I agree with you, I think a lot of points are going to be put put up here. But the difference in this team is Kansas is only plus two in the turnover margin. Oklahoma's done a really great job of protecting the football and forcing turnovers. They're plus 10 in the turnover margin. I think that's a big thing for them. Oklahoma's defense, while they do give up some yardage in this, they're going to figure out a way to turn over this turn over the Jayhawks one or two times in this game. Give Dylan Gabriel a short field. Let him punch it in a few times there. But yeah, so I got Oklahoma win this game. They're cruising because next week is Bedlam. And what could be is the final Bedlam in in the near future. There's no plans to, for that game to take. So Oklahoma's got to be careful in that one too, though. Like this is a, a zombie Oklahoma team in 2023. 20, they have risen from the dead and, and are munching on the rest of the Big 12's brains right now. Oh, actually, bring up, could they be looking ahead to Bedlam and maybe overlook Kansas? Who knows? That That's actually might set up, it, you know, it's an 11 a.m. kick there in the, mid, you know, in the Midwest. Sleepy, maybe not ready to play. So anything can happen. That's why college football is so crazy. Right. All right, Fresh. Let's go all the way back out to the West Coast and to the Utah Utes. Let's see what happens. We do this one here fresh because we, I don't know if we've picked Utah right this season. Oregon, six and one on the year, three and one the conference. They play at 330 against the Utah Utes. They're six and one as well. They're only losses to Oregon State. At time of record, Oregon is a six and a half point road favorite going into Utah. Over under set at 48 and a half. Fresh, I'm gonna let you be foolish first because I know if I pick this game first, I'm gonna I'm gonna get ripped apart in the comment section here. And it, go ahead if you don't like what I'm gonna say, by all means, comment on the video here. But man, I don't think we picked Utah right this year, so I'll let you no. you start off with this one. Um, first thing I have is can Oregon stay alive in the Pac-12 slash college football playoff conversation? Um. You know, two losses in, in the league, it's probably going to be, you know, good night Irene from that perspective. If you beat Utah, it's another feather in your cap. Because right, they obviously are the two-time defending champion. They are a prolific program, whether they're not sexy or not, but they are, they get it done. Um, this is the chance. If you lose, you're done. You know, before November and the rest of the game to sort of fill out the schedule and go to a bowl game and, you know, hope your recruits stay and sign in December and, and move forward. If you win, it, it really makes football relevant going forward from there. Um, it's a big game for Dan Lanning. Um, hasn't played USC yet, but he's 0-2 versus Washington. He obviously got destroyed by Georgia in his first ever game you know, last year. Uh, he hasn't had that big win, that, that true I'm, I'm here win, Oregon's here win. Um, that really is just shattered. That really is announced, in, in my opinion. I might be wrong, but I just don't have not seen that one where it's like, Boom, Oregon's truly serious. They beat BYU last year. They, Yeah, they destroyed Colorado this year on national television and took out the hype. But then we saw him make coaching mistakes 
versus Washington again um, and then not win. So where's that breakout moment? Where's that finally breakthrough moment for Dan Lanning and the Oregon Ducks? Um, you know, can Bo Nix have a Heisman moment in this game? Um, I, I've got a feeling he'll score points versus USC because everybody does. But Utah's defense is different. If you go out there and put up numbers against Utah's defense and you win in Salt Lake City, that's a statement to at least keep yourself in the conversation and to get people's attention. Because after that loss to Washington, people are kind of like, all right, Oregon, you know, they're top 15, but are we done taking them seriously? This is a chance for them to re-announce themselves in the race and keep, keep stay relevant and jump back in the top 10 because Oregon State, they're right there. Um, and they have a pretty good resume too. And you could get passed in the, in, in the state as uh, being the relevant program. You're, you're the flagship, I get it. But if Oregon State is putting up better numbers and they're getting more top 25 wins and more impressive wins, the, the flavor of the Ducks and, and Bo Nix is going to start fading from the, you know, from the, the steam. And USC has already kind of gone irrelevant anyway. So, you know, what, where's your statement? When are you going to show up and get the job done? That's what I want to see from Dan Lenning and Bo Nix, you know, and that entire team, putting people down, like going in there and having a, a statement win. Game day is in town. You have a chance of really, you know, Showing up. Last time game day showed up at Washington was against when you guys played him and you lost. Can you change the course? Uh, that's what I'm looking for in this football game. We know what your Oregon football team is going to show up. We know Utah. They're going to show up with, you know, helmets on, pads on. I don't care who, what the name is in the backs of the jerseys. They're going to hit you in the mouth. They're going to play great um, defense. They're going to dominate the line of scrimmage. And they're going to grind out wins late in football game. I don't care who the numbers, numbers and the names change. It's the program mentality that remains the same under Kyle Whittingham. It's been going on forever. They just grind out wins and they get it done. And being at home is a hostile environment. It's not a night kick, but it's still going to be a hostile environment. And that fan base is going to be fired up after their win over USC, recharging them and getting them energized. Game day on campus is going to even make it more. So it's going to be a hostile environment. How does Oregon go in there and get the job done? How do they survive? Um, I've picked against Utah. A lot. I've had an egg on my face, but it's not, I just can't pick against Kyle Whittingham. I think they're going to, that defense is going to show up energized. Um, Utah will win. The under will hit. The Utes defense will show up. Utah will win the football game um, and still keep themselves alive in the Pac 12 picture. And Dan Lanning will have a lot of questions to answer. All right, Fresh, I'm going to ask you a trivia question. Do you have any uh, – I'll give you within within 30 days. See if you can get this within 30 days. I'll give you a 30-day window. When was the last time Utah lost in Salt Lake City in a non-COVID year? When was the last time Utah lost in Salt Lake in a non-COVID year and even then, they only lost once at home that year. I'm going to say 2017 to Oregon. Okay. It is September 15th, 2018 to Washington. Just think how long, how dominant they have been there. I take out the COVID year. They lost once during the COVID year because there there's all sorts of different things. There weren't fans in the stands half the time. There are different regulations depending on where you lived in the country. And it, the Pac-12 season was only a five-game season that year. It happened late. So it is so difficult to go into Rice-Eccles and win a football game. If, you, if Oregon's going to want to do this, everyone's going to be pointing at Bo Nix and say it's going to have to be Bo Nix. It's going to have to be Bo Nix. Bo Nix is going to have to be the one to – win this football game and I say nay I say nay nay on that one I say it's got to have to be Bucky Irving and and Jordan James the two of those kids they're going to have to really pound the rock Utah is only allowing 78 yards rushing a game right now if you're going to go into Salt Lake and win this football game it's going to have to be on the ground you're going to have to soften up the Utah defense you're going to have to force them to kind of bring an extra man in the box because you're getting five, six, seven yards a clip. Dan Lane's done a good job kind of changing the offensive personality there. I don't think he's quite done yet, but he's working on it. It's a nice work in progress there. 
Can they line up and smash mouth Utah in the face in this? Cam Rising just a couple days ago was ruled out for the season. So Bryson Barnes doesn't have to worry about looking over his shoulder. When is Cam Rising coming back? When is Cam Rising coming back? That's who they're going to talk about. The other thing for Oregon, though, I'm going to tell you this. is my boy, Troy Clifford Franklin. I need Orlando Jones to show up in a Troy Franklin jersey. I need this to happen. If anyone knows or Orlando Jones, please, I need him. I need Troy Franklin to dr- dress up as Clifford Franklin from a replacement. I love it. Fresh for me. I'm taking a look at this here. Utah's done a great job. Bryson Barnes has played very, very nicely. He's not cam rising. He needs a little bit more, but you got. Vaki over there, who's playing a two-way player. Everything we thought Travis Hunter was going to be and consistently be, Sion Vaki has been playing safety, playing running back, playing wide receiver at times. The kid's doing a little bit of everything. But the name to always remember, we're talking Utah football, and this is this is like a great game of names, is Money Parks, the guy who's cashing checks in the end zone. I like this kid a lot. Money Parks has been a nice wide receiver. We've seen him for the last couple of years. We've loved the, this kid's name. He, he's he been a little bit slow lately. He has been hasn't been playing as well. I think this could be an, a, one of those games where he kind of reintroduces himself to the college football world. I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm having such a hard time picking against Utah. But I think Oregon's also very, very pissed off right now i think that people have really kind of said oregon really you're not that great and i think they need to remind people that you know what though i'm not picking against kyle winningham anymore i'll be i'd rather be wrong picking against oregon so give me the utes give me the six and a half points i'll take the utes uh i'm gonna change i had oregon win this game and i'm sitting here just thinking about while i'm talking about these guys yep nope not doing that as much, and if Orlando Jones shows up on the Oregon sideline, change my pick. That's the only way. Or that's the only way it changes. That was so. classic Lee Corso right there, going up there, leaning one direction, the last second is pulling out the other head of the other team and putting it on and waving goodbye as they go off. That was that was a great. That was a great little, you know, just lure them in, lure them in, and then boom, go opposite. I like it. <sighs> yeah, I just can't do it. I can't do it as much as I want to say like. We need to, Utah's eventually going to lose in Salt Lake again sometime. It's going to happen. I I just don't know if it's going to be this weekend. So, all right, Fresh, let's go to the game of the week. The world's largest outdoor cocktail party right here in our own backyard, Jacksonville, Florida. It is one of the best rivalry games out there. I would say easily the number two neutral site rivalry game, only second to the Red River rivalry shootout in the Cotton Bowl. It is the annual Georgia-Florida game played at 3.30 on CBS. Right now, time to record, and I thought this was high. Georgia, 14-and-a-half point favorite in this game. Over-under is set at 40 Seven points. Fresh, I got another number for you. 1,085 days. That is the last time the Georgia Bulldogs suffered what I consider a regular season loss. And who was it to? It was to these Florida Gators. Fresh, you're the resident Georgia fan. I'll turn it over to you. Well, the cocktail party is, uh, I think for both fan bases, there are joys and there are pains um, as throughout the history, throughout the annals. Uh, different generations have different, I think for any kind of college fan base, different, different generations have different teams that they hate more than the other, um, depending on what conference you play or what, how things roll. Um, people in the 90s, Florida fans didn't really think much of Georgia, but people who grew up in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, they hate Georgia because Georgia beat them all, all the time. It's the exact opposite. If you grew up in the 90s and 2000s as a Georgia fan, Florida's 
pretty high on your shit list because they beat the trash out of the dogs a lot. Um, when you come into this game, both fan bases, if you're the favorite, you always kind of feel a little nervous um, because just weird things can happen. Upsets happen in any kind of rivalry. And that word, you always come in and have a little, you know, keep yourself, you talk yourself some junk, but you keep yourself a little, you know, wary at times. Um, you know, in, two, in two, 1997, Florida coming off their national title, thought they were going to roll through. Georgia was a 20 and a half point underdog and they won. Um, 2005, Georgia rolls in, top 10 team. Florida having a rough year. Uh, the week before, DJ Shockley gets hurt. Joe Tereshinsky is a starting quarterback, and uh, Florida pulls off the upset. Uh, 2012, Florida's number two in the country. Georgia rolls in with a loss and beats them. Um, things happen. Uh, it, you know, there's a, a year where Georgia rolls in, rolling high, highly ranked team, favored, and on a fake field goal and a Publix bagger, 12th string running back, takes it to the house, and Florida goes on to win. Crazy things happen in this football game. Both fan bases have seen both ends of the spectrum. And uh, it's a weird where both fan bases have a respect for each other. And then in the parking lot, and then when the game kicks off, the hatred really boils over. Uh, it's, a, it's a fun environment. It's a great environment. And you really, as much as you want to predict what's going to happen in that football game, just like any rivalry, crazy things can ensue. And that's why you have to be prepared and you've got to play a full four quarters. You look back. 2001, 2021, it was a kind of a low scoring, clunky first half. And then Nolan Smith gets a turnover, dog score. Nolan Smith gets a turnover, dog score. Florida goes out again, throws a pick six to Nicobe Dean. And within a blink of an eye, it's a blowout. Um, last year, it was a tight ball game. And then the throw to the, you know, the back shoulder throw, Bowers sort of taps himself, takes it down the sideline. Uh, before that, it was kind of a tight thing, was kind of clunky. And then they sort of pulled away from there. But it, people play a little tight in this football game because there is a lot that can happen. you got to be wary of what's going to go on. And I think Billy Napier and the Gators still, you know, you beat Tennessee at home, but they always beat Tennessee. They're still looking for that one true big win. It's year number two. Can Billy Napier get that W? Can he really assert himself as that head coach, you know, for the Gators going forward in the future? They've been doing great on the recruiting trail. Can they get that one true big-time win, either it's, Georgia or Florida State or both to really say, I'm here, I'm fully, I'm locked in. The Utah game opener last year was one thing. I, you know, things happen in an opener, but beating Florida State or beating Georgia or beating both in a year would really supplant yourself as being the head coach that truly arrives for Florida. And I think that's what they're kind of looking for. And I expect them to come out and pull out all the stops in this ball game. Um, you know, Florida is a run first football team. And that's where I really want to start out this football game looking at it. The Florida running attack versus the dog rush defense. Georgia's allowing 91 yards rushing a game, tops in the SEC. Florida's rushing for 141 yards a game. That's 10th in the SEC. Can Florida find a way to run the football and be successful at it? You don't have to run for eight yards every carry. If you can run for four and manage you know, the clock, manage the down distance, get wear out the Georgia defense, maybe in the second half you have a chance to hit a couple big plays and pull off the upset. But you've got to run the football that also slows down a pass rush that could come into play if you're down or in, or even using play action off of that. You've got to find a way to run the football game. Can Florida's offensive line and can their running backs help put themselves in position to succeed? We've talked about Graham Mertz. He's actually been improved this year compared to the past. But the play action game and the ground game helped Graham Mertz be successful. And then per- Pearsall and the receiver, they show up when that play action game is in play. If they can't run the ball successfully and the dogs' defense can start teeing off, that passing success – for Mertz might not be there, but they have to have that running game to get that going. Quietly, they do. The Gators do have the sixth best passing attack in the SEC, averaging about 280 a game. But it really it all feeds off of the ground game. They use the ground game, set up the passing game, and go from there. It's who Billy Napier is. He wants to own the line of scrimmage, wants to run the football, and build a passing game off of that. And all those things work in succession together. Everyone thought George's offense was going to take a major turn down this year. Um, you know, Stetson Bennett, all the guys getting drafted, so on and so forth. They're number two in total yards in the SEC, number second, and the second best passing in, in, in regards to passing yards per game in the SEC, and they're third nationally in total yards per game, and they have the fifth best passing attack. Carson Beck, Jacksonville native, has this. him and Mike Bobo have put this offense together, receivers showing up, making plays. 
patchwork to an offensive line together, patchwork to ground game together, but guys are starting to get a little healthier outside of Brock Bowers, and guys are starting to click and get on the same page. Can they continue to keep building up that offense moving forward? It's been great up to this point. They've had some slow starts, but they've certainly seen some success. But from here on out, this offense has got to be able to show up much more consistent and much earlier like they did versus Kentucky. you got Florida here. you got Missouri, who has a very electric offense. Ole Miss is an electric offense in Tennessee. It's just Tennessee in that game in Knoxville. You're going to have to be able to show up and score points. You can't have a slow start in any of these football games. Are the offensive numbers a mirage, or are they truly signs of this offense really developing and being successful moving forward? That's what I want to see. Can Carson Beck come in this football game and put up points early, get comfortable, and let the defense take over, and then manage through there? Uh, or will jitters of being in your home stadium? Now, the history on Carson Beck from Jacksonville, grew up a Tim Tebow fan, obviously he knows this rivalry. I'm going to go ahead and bet he's a Jaguar fan being born and raised here in Jacksonville. He's playing in the stadium of his hometown, in an NFL stadium. That's something you, you're going to walk in, you know, in Athens, walk in anywhere else, that's one thing. But a stadium you've seen, probably been in as a fan multiple times in your life, and now you're the starting quarterback at, we've got to factor that in. Will there be jitters early in this football game, or will he find a way to feel comfortable? Um, the, is there pressure of playing in Jacksonville as a Georgia you know, quarterback and not playing for Florida? Because he was recruited by Florida to play for baseball. Um, where do these things come into play? Where's his mind at when he walks into, you know, to, into the stadium and, and when kickoff hits, you know, where does he go from there? And does the jitters get into play or does he just sort of settle in, make some throws, get some runs and let the game go from there. So keep an eye on that as the, as the ball game moves forward. George's defense hasn't been as electric from a statistical perspective as it has in the past. They're not giving up six points a game. They're giving up 14 and 202 yards a game. Those are both tops in the SEC, but those aren't, whether well, we've traditionally seen in the past few years where they're number two or number one in the country. So will this George defense rotating some younger players, getting them in there? How will they perform in this football game? How will they perform today, I mean, on Saturday, and going forward down the stretch against some pretty good offenses? Have they developed? Are the injury concerns being addressed? Have guys gotten in those rotations where they feel more comfortable in playing and understanding the system? That's what I want to see. How does this defense continue to show focus and drive? They look great versus Kentucky. They kind of looked a little clunky versus Vanderbilt. Where are we starting to see this defense you know, shake out? They looked a little hit or miss sometimes early on in the season. Where are they going to get their vibe and start playing at a higher, more intense rate from start to finish in this football game? Florida's defense, we didn't expect we were, you know, much from them coming into the year, and they've actually been very, very improved and shown a little ferocity uh, on the field. Um, giving up 20 a game, allowing 312, both fifth in the SEC, but – the game film of watching the way they're flying and organized and communicating at the second and third levels has been something we haven't seen at Florida in a while. They weren't good in 2020. That 2020 defense was horrible. 21's defense was pretty bad. 22, eh. But we're starting to see an improved defense there at Florida. They obviously got the Ray Davis and Kentucky ran the ball all over them a couple weeks ago, but they've shown in other games where they could be improved and play a little more aggressive, get after the quarterback. What defense for Florida shows up? Um, do they play with a little extra ferocity? Do they get some turnovers? Do they force some confusion? That's what this going to have. Keep them in the football game. Can they stay in the ball game? They don't. They don't have to um, give up. You know, a thousand points. Can they bend not break mentality? Maybe allow field goals to the red zone, not touchdowns. How does this Florida defense show up on Saturday to pull off an upset um, and, and take out Georgia? It's college football. Ball bounces different ways. We just saw Virginia beat North Carolina. How do they become disruptors and take down Carson Beck and this Georgia offense and Mike Boa's led offense? Um, I expect Florida to come out pulling out any kind of trick play they potentially have. This is a game for, you know, if you get it, you're still alive for Atlanta. Um, and that's a, a big thing where we come into the season. Did Florida even have a chance? It, they have everything ahead of them. They already beat Tennessee. They still have Georgia on the schedule. They got Missouri on the schedule, LSU. But if you beat Georgia, it keeps your hopes for Atlanta alive. And that's what anybody wants to have in any kind of conference play. Are you still alive in November for a conference championship game? I think Florida's going to come out, trick plays, watch for some crazy stuff, keep themselves alive and take the initiative and be the aggressive football team. At least they try to. Um, Kirby hates Florida. Uh, he was there in Athens when Kurt Spurrier put up 50 back in 95. This game means something to him. It means something to the fan base. Um, so I don't expect them to take this thing lightly. They're not going to overlook this game. You know, we talk about this with Ryan Day. Does he take the Michigan series too much, or does he care more about the playoff? Um, I think he's getting better at that, but Kirby takes this game seriously. I think this team's going to be focused and locked in. Um, it'll be clunky early, but 
Georgia will find a way to win the ball game late through the second half. But in the first half, if you're going to bet, bet Florida first half or at least the points, maybe take Florida. Georgia wins it outright in the end. Um, 14 and a half is a lot to cover in a rivalry game. I don't think Georgia covers, but Georgia will win. Um, but take the under on the overall. All right, Presh. So my biggest question going into this game is how does Georgia's offense change because of Brock Bowers being out? Brock Bowers having surgery on that ankle. Hopefully we'll be back in the near future, but he's been ruled out for this game. And when you talk to fans and stuff like that, you, you always hear them say next man up. And I hate, I hate that. I hate when you, especially when it's a player to the magnitude of Brock Bowers, next man, then, the, oh, we got to have the next man up mentality. I'm like, that is so disrespectful to the player that you're being injured. The fact that we're saying, oh, obviously the guy behind him can obviously play just as good as our generational tight end over here. That's ridiculous. That is absolutely ridiculous. Brock Bowers is probably at least, and again, I'm going to go conservative on this. I'm going to say bare minimum a top 20 draft pick in this next year's draft. Probably closer to top 15. He would be. He would probably be the best tight end coming out of this in this draft class. How does the Georgia offense change? Does it change? Are you able to throw the ball in there? You, you know, Brock Bowers is 41 receptions on the year. He's been your number one overall receiver. You take a look, 567 yards on, on the season. Losing him is a big deal. He is a safety blanket for Carson Beck. You've had two weeks to prepare for this. But like you said, going into your home stadium like Carson Beck is going to do, it, it's going to become more difficult when you lose that safety blanket. When you lose, hey, you know what? It's third and nine. It's third and nine. Florida's gone up by a touchdown on us. And I need a first down to keep this drive going. Let me find Brock Powers is going to figure out a way to get open. Brock Powers single-handedly won you the Auburn game. He, he is a great football player. How does Beck respond not having that? Does Beck rise to the occasion? Does he become a better football player because of this injury? Does some other wide receiver or a, a backup tight end step up and, and, and make a big play when they need it the most? I think that while that's going to be a lot of the talking points, it's definitely one of my talking points. I think that this is also going to be a referendum on the Georgia offensive line and Dejon Edwards. Is We've all saw what Kentucky did to Florida on the ground. Can Georgia go old school, line up, smack them in the mouth, go power eye type of thing, and just run the ball down their throat? If Edwards can get moving, can get going in this game, I think it's going to be a, a quick day for the dogs and we'll really kind of move along pretty quickly in this one. For Florida, I, I get you fresh and I think that you're right. Kirby Smart takes this game very seriously. He He probably does not think very highly of the Gators. Billy Napier needs this win. He needs this win. And we can talk all about like Napier's there Florida's five and two. And you take a look at this, but your five win out of your five wins, only one of them's respectable, and that's the win at home versus Tennessee. McNeese, Charlotte, come on. Vandy, South Carolina, and barely being South Carolina. Billy Napier needs this win more than anyone else. And at times, and it's the old saying, you know, at desperate times, people do desperate things. And I think Billy Napier is going to do, a, because he wins this game, don't be shocked to see Florida take a lot. And I mean a lot of chances. It's if those chances play off. You're going to take some high-risk play calls in this one. And if, if you hit on a couple of them, watch out. It could be a long afternoon. Florida could, could really do some damage to Georgia. The other thing is, can they run the football? If they're able to run the football, if Johnson, ETN are able to get going, you know, you talked about Carson Beck coming, coming home and playing here in Jacksonville. But you talk about 
Trevor Etienne and his brother Travis Etienne being the lead running back for the Jaguars. That also means that family is here in Jacksonville for him. And that's going to be a big time game for, for him. I wouldn't be shocked if Etienne shows out in this game. Now, not saying that that Florida is going to win, but I'm looking at this. The thing to me, though, Fresh, and I'll tell you, all Georgia fans this, any other quarterback, any other quarterback, and this would be acceptable. But Georgia, for the last two years, three years on this podcast, I have told you how bad of a quarterback Graham Mertz is. And when Graham Mertz goes up against good competition, he plays like crap. Now, I'm, this is a family-friendly show, and I'm not going to drop profanity like fresh over here at this, but if Georgia loses to a Graham Mertz-led football team, by God, your season's over. Like, oh, again, yeah. it's, it's over. And, and again, you can puff out your chest. You can say all the things you want. You lost to Graham Mertz. You cannot lose to Gra- a Graham Mertz-led football team. You just can't. Uh, I, I know he's playing better at Florida, but I think those stats are inflated against way lesser competition. Georgia, you, you have to channel the Kentucky game again. You, you have to channel that game. You put up, what, 34 first half points in that game, I believe? Mm-hmm. Let me go back and real oh, quick goodness. check that. Yeah, 34. You put up 34 points. You were up 34 to 7 at halftime. That's the type of game you need. You cannot let Florida hang around in this football game. If you let, if you, if it, the Auburn type of game comes out, watch out. Florida's going to bite you in this one. You don't let, you have to put Florida down now. You cannot give them hope. You cannot give them a, a belief that they can win this football game because the minute they start believing that, especially third quarter, fourth quarter, late in the game, all of a sudden, Florida is going to be a very, very dangerous football team. And that pressure of that 1,085-day streak is going to start building and building up there. If you have Brock Bowers, I wouldn't worry about this. But it is a scary situation to be in, and we want to see how Carson Beck is going to respond to this. I'm with you, Fresh. I'm, I'm going to say this. I'm not going to pick against Georgia in this game. I really, really don't think that but that 14 and a half is really high to me for a rivalry game i'm i would say this is a a seven to ten point range football game i think that Georgia's going to win by anywhere in that realm uh the nice thing i'll say this if georgia can kind of keep florida at an arm's reach the entire game it'll be a really really good win for them and again a wire to wire type win i want to see that out of the georgia bulldogs I'm telling you this. You said earlier when we were talking about football games about we're one week away from the first college football poll. This is going to this game is going to be the lasting impression for who's going to get that first. I mean, again, it is the first ranking of the poll, but who's going to be ranked number one? Who's going to be ranked number two? I know the AP and the coaches, all that. That's all going to mean nothing here in a week. Like, who gives a crap about what a bunch of beat writers think and what we think or what anyone else think? The only poll that's going to matter is going to be the college football poll. Um, give me Georgia in this game. I'm actually going to say take the over. I think there's going to be more than 47 points scored in this game. I think we're looking at like a 31-24 game, 22 game, something like that. Like I said, 7-10 to 10 point win by the Georgia Bulldogs for this game. Um, you know, with Bowers out, Oscar Delps can be obviously number one tight end, but I think Lad McConkey is going to have his game of the season. He's been dealing with some injuries, sort of get recovered, work him back in. I think he's going to be that Wes Welker, you know, slot player that he's going to be there looking at on third down in critical situations. So keep an eye on you know, Lad making his uh, really his real return onto the lineup on, on Saturday. Yeah, absolutely. One of the best tailgate scenes out there, folks. If if you are someone who's listening to this up north and you've never been to the Georgia-Florida game and you're talking about a, a marquee rivalry game, it's one of the most fun environments I've ever been in. And I, I don't have a 
rooting interest for either one of these teams. I've been been there on behalf of some Georgia fans before, so I root for Georgia because, you know, that's who had the tickets. Uh, but it is a fun game to go to. It's definitely one that, like I said, I would rate it as the number two neutral site rivalry game, and the only one that I would even perceive as better is Red River. And, and that's just because of the historical significance to that type of game. But this is a great one. Tune in for it. It's always a fun matchup. It's a great rivalry game. So before you guys leave out for tonight, hey, hit that subscribe button for us. It helps us out. We're on our way to 1,000 subscribers. We want to hit 1,000 subscribers before Thanksgiving. So it doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't do anything. Just hit the subscribe button. That's all we need. Hit the notification bell, too. If you really like these videos, hit the notification bell. You'll get notified every single time we drop a new video. And we have a lot of really cool stuff coming up. We're going to be talking about the rankings that come out here for the college football playoff. And we're going to go into that stretch run for the month of November. Big time games in November coming up and all leading us to our biggest weekend of the year, which is rivalry week. I want to send a special thank you to our producer, Drew. Without him, none of this is possible. Make sure you're checking out his show. He has stuff that comes out every Sunday about the NFL and all of the things going on, how he sees matchups in the NFL. And make sure you go over and check out our boy Steve-O over there at the photo finish. I know it's not horse racing season yet, but if you are a person like me who knows diddly squat about horse racing and need an idea of how to read a horse racing form, check him out. He's got a great video out there on the Spinnable Sports page to how to read a horse racing form. Even someone like me can understand it. So. Check out SpinnableSports.com. Like, subscribe, wherever you get your podcast from. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Fresh. Hey, Georgia, Florida, it's a brown water bowl game. A brown water ball game. I got the Knob Creek ready. Um, I just can't wait. It's always a fun time to play football, but it's, this game does mean a lot, and it's going to be an exciting afternoon. Yeah, you got uh, Knob Creek, and I am going to be watching the football game while doing Trunk or Treat with the. Uh, the domesticated family. So much well, two different that. two different lifestyles that Fresh and I live here. So always fun times. Always fun times. Everybody, enjoy your college football Saturday. Tune in, subscribe, spread the word about us. And until next time, bye y'all.